Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Um, thank you to our online audiences for your patience. We had a power shortage. Um, and our production AV crews here worked really hard to fix that. So now we're back on. And um, I hope you've enjoyed this extended uh, coffee break as an opportunity to network and discuss some further. Um, we will now begin with our first panel on the role of the supervisor in reducing the protection gap. And Teresa uh, has clearly introduced this uh, subtopic to us in her presentation. The panel will be moderated by Mia Tom from Semfree. Mia is the technical director at Semfree, responsible for their work in insurance market development. Mia joined Semfri in 2012, where her work focuses on exploring business models used to deliver financial services to the low-income market, as well as developing and supporting financial sector development-related policies to improve inclusion. Mia also manages Semfri's Risk Remittances Integrity Program with Financial Sector Development Africa to improve the role that insurance can play in development in Sub-Saharan Africa and is an active member of the Microinsurance Network and the UNEP PSI. Mia, you can come and take a seat. Our panelists and discussants are Abdel Jalil El Hafre of the Direction du Trésor au Ministère des Finances Morocco, Kerwin Martin, South African Reserve Bank, and Israel Muchena from Holland, Mozambique. Please welcome our panelists. So I just want to, perfect, great. I just want to flag, we've oh, got sorry. another oh, <laughs> discussant, sorry. Vivian Pearson from SAIA. So Vivian's the CEO of the South African Insurance Association. So I think, Vivian, I think we can, oh, you have to take the mic, sorry. Uh, we'll need some technical assistance here. Thank you so much. Good. So I'm really looking forward to this discussion because what we've been hearing earlier today and also yesterday during the, the, the ARC discussion is that we're facing this problem of, of climate change and increasing natural disasters. But it's such a big problem that can often be very disempowering. What do we actually do? What do we as individuals in this room need to do to try and tackle this problem? Because I think often when we face with something that's, that's so problematic, we heard issues earlier today of $1 billion dollars um, I think Israel will probably mention figures around the, the cyclone of Idai that's far signific more significant than those kind of figures. What can we actually do as an insurance industry and as regulators to help make our countries more resilient in the face of these kind of shocks and, and disasters? So I really look forward to the discussion by the panel. Um, we're going to start with a presentation uh, from Abdel Jalil from Morocco. And then we'll go on to a discussion from Cohen, and then we'll have a panel discussion and questions from the audience after that. Thank you very much. Okay. <laughs> Cohen, do you want to join me? Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup pour cette invitation. Je suis très content de partager avec vous aujourd'hui. Modeste to experience share the modest Moroccan experience concerning Alors, uh, risk insurance. I'll give you a bit of time to put okay. your headphones on. That needs to go up. I don't know if we've, we've got the. Okay. Donc, comme beaucoup de pays dans le monde, euh, like Maroc, uh, many countries in the world, Morocco is uh, exposed to risks of natural disasters. Most often it is floods and sometimes with the loss of lives and, and important economic losses as well. Less uh, frequently it is risk of uh, earthquakes 
with a very high impact on society. In 1960, uh, there was an earthquake that uh, took the lives of one-third of a tourist uh, city. In uh, 2004, there was uh, another earthquake that uh, took the lives of many people. So we have a scheme uh, for um, insurance against natural disasters. We realize uh, the importance of setting up a scheme for that reason. And since then, we continued to reflect on the scheme up until 2014, when another earthquake occurred. We realized that uh, we were still thinking about a scheme that uh, did not uh, materialize. Law, the law was adopted in uh, 2016, and this is the scheme that we ended up with. This is the subject of my presentation today. So I'm going to introduce to you the scheme. Globally, there are two uh, parts, uh, an introduction of a mandatory insurance. There is also a solidarity fund that uh, covers uh, persons that are not insured. As I said, the scheme was introduced in 2016, and it covers disasters, uh, whether they are natural disasters or caused by men. Uh, natural uh, disasters have been described by decree, floods, um, earthquakes, tsunamis. So we described it in a decree because it's simpler than the law. Uh, so we will be able to lengthen this list uh, later. The uh, selection of uh, natural disasters has been listed uh, based on their importance and impact in Morocco. I will talk to you later about uh, risk uh, insurance against uh, disasters. So there is a decree from the head of government uh, that uh, declares an event as being catastrophic and that is uh, published in the Government Gazette and uh, with a, it is also a matter for international insurers who accept the Government Gazette's publication. I said that there are two different parts. There is insurance for um, natural persons and companies that have uh, insurance contracts. And uh, also a fund for uh, people who are not covered by an insurance, any insurance contract. I'll speak uh, about that a little bit later. Uh, that is managed through a public company that is a solidarity fund against natural disasters. Uh, so let me start with the insurance side of it. So the law of uh, 2016 has uh, led to the fact that it is not uh, really an insurance, but it is a guarantee that is uh, included in the list. Uh, that is a damage uh, to property, damage uh, that is caused by a natural disaster or a catastrophic event. There is also insurance uh, contracts uh, for uh, third, third parties, damage caused to third parties, and that covers uh, damages uh, in, to the vehicle and also uh, injury that the driver may have, uh, including their beneficiaries in case of death. It also uh, covers the owners of the vehicle and 
uh, their spouses and their children and also covers the death of the vehicle owner. There are other insurance contracts that cover a personal injury for the people who are not salaried employees. This guarantee is subjected to an extra premium which is uh, a percentage of the main premium. So in order not to have excessive risk uh, in the scheme, the law has uh, um, set up uh, ceilings to uh, compensate uh, victims by event and by year. So the minimum ceiling is two billion per event, and uh, three um, million dirham is approximately three hundred thousand dollars, and uh, the, they have reached the ceiling of nine billion dirhams. That is for natural disasters. For man-made disasters, the ceiling is 300 million of dirhams. In the case of these ceilings being exceeded, uh, there is another amount that is introduced. So to support the insurance mechanism, uh, the state gives its guarantee uh, covering uh, the default of an international insurer. In order to have this guarantee, the companies have to sign an agreement with the state uh, a convention that will give uh, conditions and modalities of the guarantee. And uh, also concerning reinsurance, if uh, the FSEC gives an advance to the insurers. So there is also a solidarity fund um, dedicated to natural disasters. This fund uh, was uh, set up uh, given the fact that the, the rate of uh, penetration of insurance in Morocco is not very developed. Uh, car insurance uh, is mandatory and it uh, covers uh, theoretically all uh, vehicles that are on the road. And then there is uh, a property insurance that uh, is not uh, mandatory. So the penetration rate is about 2%. Therefore, the idea of creating a solidarity fund that covers uh, persons who are not insured, that is uh, managed uh, by a public company, and it is managed by a director, and it is chaired by the head of government. The resources are from a tax, and the main expense of the fund is uh, for a personal injury and for loss of main residence. So the amount uh, given is uh, similar to a compensation for a physical disability. And also there is a, a compensation amount for loss of resources. And also when a residence uh, is no longer habitable, there is um, an amount that is allocated to that.
it uh, also gives the owner of a main residence uh, enough uh, money to fix the main residence. The ceiling of 250,000 dirhams corresponds to $25,000, and it is more or less uh, the value of a social residence. So to identify vulnerable uh, persons, we identified a ceiling for the residence, and it is a way of uh, forcing, in brackets, uh, people who have means to, uh, in to get insurance for their residences. Let me now go to the conclusion. As I said, the law was introduced in 2016 and it was the entry into force depended on the decrees. But we realized that shortly afterwards that entry into force depended on preparing a certain number of questions. First, we had to identify the risk that is important to establish uh, the premium, and it, it is also important with when we have discussions with international reinsurers. So this will allow us to estimate the average yearly losses and the probable maximum loss. Of course, this depends on the quality of the information that we have. We have uh, certain weaknesses in terms of data. We are working to improve on that. The model that is used in our country uses a historical data. Uh, mainly on the earthquake and, and floods and for tsunamis. It is just uh, estimates. And uh, this is based on uh, uh, man-caused violence. So historical data do not take into account climate change. So we are busy reflecting on how climate change can affect this model. The uh, second important question is that we realize the importance of uh, setting up uh, loss management. We can use uh, uh, current mechanisms that all insurers use, but there is also an important role that can be played uh, using new technology. Uh, drones, artificial intelligence, etc. But the choice of technology is so important that uh, we need to be very careful when it is about poor countries uh, with low incomes. And uh, company, certain companies can be quite convincing. So the instruments have to be adapted to uh, what the countries uh, can afford. We also realized the importance of uh, communication strategy that will be uh, different uh, based on the insurance scheme. It's a, a communication to uh, consumers that it is beneficial for them uh, to buy this insurance. So it needs. Uh, they need to be told that they have proper cover. And in terms of beneficiaries of the Solidarity Fund, they need to understand that there are ceilings. The Solidarity Fund will not cover all losses. There are ceilings, and therefore, they cannot expect everything. If they want full cover, then they have to buy insurance. There is also the importance 
of a disaster risk of finance to include that with the disaster risk management so that one complements the other because uh, in uh, certain cases there needs to be arbitration. So it will be more a matter of prevention, uh, for example, the uh, construction of a dam to avoid floods. Uh, so there are, there is uh, arbitration and uh, we need to see if we need to invest in prevention or invest in construction. And uh, finally, we believe that uh, the current scheme is a good beginning and it allows, it allows the beneficiaries uh, to have minimum benefit as far as personal injury is concerned. There are other um, aspects that are not covered, for example, drought. And there's also other economic factors that uh, are not covered, for example, public infrastructures and also activities that are not covered. So these are the areas in which we need to improve. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Abdel Jalil. Very interesting presentation. I think, especially the comments you make around thinking about prevention and the, the quality of data and what that means for how we can, you know, what we can actually cover and what we know. <laughs> it's very relevant things for all of us to think about. Um, I'm going to hand over to Kerwin and then we can have a bit of a discussion about uh, the, the Moroccan um, experience. Okay. Thank you. And Kevin, you can either stand or you can I'll sit. sit yeah. your it's your choice. A, it's, a, it's a conversation. <laughs> Perfect. Though, yeah. So if I can just have the presentation on. Um, so so whilst you're getting that presentation, um, there's a number of items that was highlighted in, in his presentation that I didn't cover in this particular presentation, but uh, there's a similar nature in South Africa. So I just want to highlight some of the insurers that's government owned in South Africa. Um, to just give you a sense what's the government-owned insurance activities in South Africa. So when we had a discussion earlier today, there was a discussion on CESREA. Um, CESREA emanated from the 1976 South, South African Soweto riots, and there wasn't actually appetite within the insurance market, and that's why it was born and government is, is the, the main shareholder there. So we not a not an insurer per se, but we also have got a road accident fund. Um, road accident fund, it's basically funded through a few levy. But this is a fund that was established in the early 90s, um, uh, ni 1920s, and it all changed over a period of time. So previously it was a motor vehicle accident fund. It transformed into the road accident fund, but it's also sponsored by government as well. So government is the the main shareholder in that regard. But other, other entities within or insurers that we supervise as, as a prudential authority, um, we talk about the ECA, which is an export credit agency in South Africa. There's equivalent to export credit insurance in South Africa, which through a, a subsidy, which is called the interest makeup scheme, provides cover for South Africans that does infrastructure development outside South Africa. And that's, that's where the insurance, so you've got political, <coughs> political risk in that particular country where this particular insurer provides cover. But we also have um, our unemployment insurance fund, which is not in this insurance under the, our supervision. That's a, another form of a type of insurer. Just back to the road accident fund, and it's mostly for bodily harm. Uh, uh, motor insurance is not specifically compulsory in South Africa, but when you use the South African roads and you, because it's based on a fault-based system and you're not a guilty party, the road accident fund will cover you in that regard. All right, so, so 
in terms of my presentation, just as an intro, this particular, just to latch on to the previous discussion, so, so that's why I've tried to highlight. So, so the focus of my, my presentation is mostly around risk protection gaps. And uh, I've put a micro or inclusive insurance lens over it. So I would like to highlight and, and then specifically talk to, you know, when we need to start thinking out of the box where we've got um, artificial intelligence, machine learning, and those kind of things that we need to, need to use in order to, to narrow that particular gap. So let me just start off with, obviously, in South Africa, or insurance as you know it, um, it's basically um, a well-documented and well-articulated in terms of the various roles that insurance plays in the economy. Uh, and spe specifically, if you look at big multinational insurance companies uh, like a Swiss Re and a Munich Re, they've got well-articulated documentations how um, transmission channels uh, insure up the role that insurers are playing. Even the, the World Bank has a specific doc document. However, in essence, um, it provides the necessary comfort to a policyholder and also the peace of mind for society as a whole, whether you're an individual or a, me a mega corporation or even a country. Um, however, there are people around the world, and specifically in South Africa, where there's underinsurance or no insurance. In South Africa, culturally, um, where we've, we've seen a, 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 a proliferation of lower income participants in the insurance space is basically on um, funeral business, um, which we define as microinsurance as well, um, as well as um, credit, credit protection insurance. So in that particular space, what happens if you want to buy a couch, for instance, you need to have in, in, in some of the retailers, because most of that um, acquisitions are made through a credit, credit extension. And it's the retailers that require to, you to have some form of, of, of cover in that regard. Another matter, uh, another matter is obviously in the insurance space, because insurance is a grudge purchase. Most people are thinking because the, the intangibility of an insurance product, it's, a, it's intangible. And there is a level of a trust, a tr trust deficit between either the provider of the product and the, and the lower, mostly from the lower LSMs. We understand, we understand the importance of insurance as a risk mitigation. However, there's still a large number of underutilized and specifically unappreciated by the low income. However, there's, there's also a limited appetite from product providers to, a, a, to, appropriate, to provide appropriate and value for money products uh, to this, this particular income segment. Obviously, we'll have the discussion whether there is appetite within the within the market around us. Um, so that's where I look at Vivian to just maybe kind of highlight some of those questions she wants to pose. Um, and then just in terms of looking at the sources uh, of, 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 of this particular gap, household and government in South Africa are exposed to a number of risks and are not adequately protecting to responding to, to this particular risk, specifically climate risk. The reason for, the, for these protection uh, gaps exists it varies and could result in a possible lack of cover being provided or offered, um, the affordability, consumer awareness, and I think this latches on to what Teresa was doing in uh, setting the scene. Um, for this presentation, I'm trying to kind of highlight some of these reasons, like for instance, a lack of financial education, uh, affordability of insurance, um, availability of suit suitable products that provides value to the policyholder. So let's just go on to the first lack of education. So le lack of education, um, so, so the, the thing that comes to mind is who should provide that, that education? Should we make it part of the school curriculum uh, or not? Funeral and credit protection insurance is massive in South Africa and this type of products are well entrenched in the, in the South African insurance market. However, I believe we, are all, we all need to do more to understand the other needs of those particular sector, the lower income market. Create appropriate levels of, of awareness of insurance as a risk mitigation to household. Explain and be clear in, in a simple uh, product wording or contract wording. Highlight the benefits of 
of, of, of the particular instrument, the insurance contract, don't just focus on the explain, you need to explain the long-term value. Obviously, there's a number of initi initiatives in the short term or the non-life insurance space where people can immediately, that instant uh, gratification in terms of a, a cashback kind of thing that also fosters a better understanding. But I think the important aspect is to understand the long-term value of that particular product. Right? And just looking at the availability of suitable products, again, without a proper understanding of the needs of this particular segment, you cannot design appropriate products that gives value to the, to the policyholder. It is easier for insurance companies, and also this is another debating issue, to develop and design products that's already in the insurance population, and these products are normally profitable. So to, to create some of these products for the lower income, it takes time, you need to understand it, and obviously there's, there's thin margins in respect of that. And again, uh, as I indicated earlier, we need to think out of the box and harness, and harness exa for example, technology, use big data, use machine learning to create an efficient and a cost-effective insurance model. Use technology in distributions. How does technology assist insurance in reaching clients to a large number whilst, whilst addressing the constraint of low margins and minimal fin financial infrastructure? Use what we've seen in South Africa is also use mobile networks, do digital marketing, artificial intelligence, and my favorite chatbots. Technology can also be used as a claim for claim adjudication. In particular space, uh, claims should in a claim space, it, it you should be the process. It should be quick, quickly processed, and in a transparent manner to instill a level of trust. Some of the technologies that can be used is smartphones applications, but obviously, if you think of smartphones, uh, it would not be for that particular market. Then use USSDs. For payments and premiums, use, kind of consider use mobile, mobile money or something like that to, to get a regular payment of premiums and to, to speed up the, 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 the claims payment. Right, so again, obviously, the, you can see there's a particular trend. So affordability of insurance. If we can increase that insurance pool, if you look at South Africa, and I was hearing what you were saying, Morocco has got a penetration rate of about 2 point something percent. South Africa has got a penetration rate of about 14.1. It's one of the highest Classic. in the world. But there is a lot of room to cover in, in terms of the lower income. We need to better understand the customer in the low, low, low income market. What do you consider is affordable for that segment? How can products be designed to offer adequate and value for money? Again, technology can play a significant role in that, using big data to understand the patterns, the behaviors of those policyholders, potential policyholders. Obviously, I've mentioned in the intro, possible partnerships with public sector, where you've got a PPP project, Appropriate regulation, it comes back to us as regulators to simple products and, and adopt a proportional or proportional to the risk. What we've done in South Africa is we've got microinsurance, but I guess microinsurance is not the silver bullet in respect of looking at that lower income. So the other obstacles that I think Teresa highlighted is where, for instance, um, a couple of years back, we've received a a, a, a proposal in terms of index-based insurance. Uh, and we were saying, no, this is gambling, this is speculation, all that. But obviously, in terms of our new insurance act, the authority, the prudential authority, has got the, the right to declare a product an insurance product if it, if it doesn't have the key essentials of insurance. So we've got that ability. Okay. So the next slide is just dealing with the increase, the concentration of, of, the, of, the, of the risk exposures. So we need to, again, use big data to collect quality data to identify different types of concentration exposures, um, like company-specific, the industry, and also, obviously, a, a great uh, 
a data center would be a reinsurance because they've got a holistic view of the market in some cases. Data sharing with those responsible for planning and building infrastructure. This, this particular point was quite key when, when I went through um, the Neisner Fire report, uh, the Neisner Fire 2017 report, and the key learnings from that. And I will maybe highlight some others later in this presentation. Apply a risk-based framework for insurance supervision needs to be appropriately captured with the risk incentives to diversify of risk, diversification of risk. So the, the other item is just in terms of the risk protection, is to get, uh, obviously, there's more frequent, we have seen more frequent and more severe climate-related events. So what do you consider, for instance, in that, in that particular report was, how can you prevent the, the event from happening, or what measures or early warnings do you need to have in place? What do you do during that, that, that event, and what do you do afterwards? So for, 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 for example, um, before the event, insurance need to understand the hydrometeorological hydrometer conditions, the surrounding vegetations, the homes, whether they're fireproof, or what kind of material do you use, inconsistent land management practices, understand the prevention and response activities, like for instance, as an early warning indicator, whether you will see the fire emergency centers are up to scratch. I think uh, 2015 or 14, there was an event in St. Francis. And what came clear is that the fire department, although there was a fire department, but it was never utilized, right? Or was limited utilized. So during the event, that crisis management is quite important. And we've seen um, that things like social media was used. But it also creates its own challenges. So you don't have a command center where this is the, the latest update. Because everyone has become a reporter with social media. And they are tweeting or putting things on Facebook. And that particular issue can be confusing. So I think the key lesson that we've learned from this Neisner fires is to get a more more appropriate communication in, 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 in that crisis event. So, so it's important um, that we look at that as a, as, a, as a medium that can enhance in the event, during the event, um, social media, but in a more uh, controlled manner. Right? Just in terms of time. <laughs> okay, so, so let me go over to the role of the, of the uh, insurance supervisor. Obviously, in South Africa, with the Financial Sector Regulations Act, there was the creation of two um, regulators or supervisory authorities, which is the one is responsible for prudential authority, which I'm working for, and then we've got the conduct, which is the Financial Sector Conduct Authority. In addition to that, we also had an insurance act, uh, effective from was was in 2017, effective uh, 2018. Um, so that's for the supervisor. So if you just look at the mandates of the Prudential Authority, obviously our primary mandate is to safety and soundness of financial institutions, uh, promote and enhance safety and soundness of market infrastructure, protect financial customers against the risk of those financial institutions that may fail to meet the obligations, and assist in maintaining financial stability. So quite key on our financial uh, stability review for the early edition 2019, there was a box dealing with climate, climate change or climate related events. Um, the conclusions that we have particularly reached, uh, it doesn't have a systemic impact at this particular point in time. Right. Then the financial sector act also in order to achieve the prudential authority as mandate must regulate, regulate and supervise according to the financial sector law, support sustainable competition, support financial inclusion. Uh, hence, uh, you've got a, a microinsurance framework in South Africa. So I'm just concerned with, with time, and I'm just going to highlight some of the objectives of the financial sector. Conduct authority is to protect the financial uh, customer, pr pr promoting fair treatment to customers, promoting financial literacy. That's within their mandate. And obviously, my previous comment, whether it should be part of the schooling curriculum, they've got a specific mandate. And 
the question that I've posed under the risk gap is whether we can do it on this particular um, mandate on a risk base basis where you look at where's the biggest need. Right. Um, I'll jump to the to the next next slide, uh, second last slide. How can insurance supervisors be involved? Okay, create a regulatory framework. Obviously, that's key. So you don't want to create barriers. Um, and what what in what in South Africa, obviously, quite highlight micro insurance. That the risk base in order to for risk to be more appropriately quantified. It's in protecting policyholders while being more capital efficient. Promote innovation and awareness, like for instance, innovation hubs, stand boxes. In fact, in the South African Reserve Bank, there is an innovation hub. But we're in the process of looking at how we can create stand boxes uh, in, the, in the Prudential Authority. Enhance cooperation between key stakeholders, sharing of data and information. Obviously, uh, Vivian would tell you that on a regular basis we have conversations. Um, so, so to see how we can support and assist each other, whether it's going to be the national treasury, uh, the our regulatory authorities, and the industry. So there is, um, like for instance, as I indicated, the current initiatives is a social agriculture uh, PPP project, um, index-based insurance, the Green Giza, uh, with the Department of Energy. Furthermore, there's a working group of the financial sector regulated agencies and industry associations were established to develop a framework document on sustainable finance. So that's it. Mm, great. Thanks so much, Kevin. Um, so I think we'll probably go over a little bit beyond the um, estimated time. I hope everybody can still stay around for the next 15 minutes or so because I would love to hear from our discussants um, if you've got any questions for the for the panelists, but also to reflect a little bit on your own experience, because I know Mozambique has recently been very hard hit. How do you cope with something like that as an insurance industry? And in South Africa, there's also been fascinating initiatives by the insurance industry, not necessarily even insurance products, to get involved in how risk is managed, um, like the Eden Project with the Nisner fires and the agricultural insurance scheme. Um, so, you know, kind of, I'd, I'd like to hand over to the two of you to to reflect a bit on your own experience and do you have any questions? All right, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. I really enjoyed the presentations. Uh, because of limited time, I think I'll focus on one question. Uh, and before raising this question, I want to say a sentence which I would like you to remember, <laughs> even if you forget everything else that I'm going to say today. Uh, it's a book that was published in 2004, same time as the earthquake in Morocco, 10 years after independence in South Africa, and it was by a well-known academic called Patrick Bond. And this book, I will not give you the full title, but the words I would like you to remember are, talk left, walk right. Can I repeat it? Talk left, walk right. What was he talking about? He was talking about the risk that exists in Africa sometimes that we have contradicted positions between our policies and our actions. And the question I'd like to raise and I'd like for our presenters to reflect on the experiences in Morocco and South Africa, and as well for us uh, following this conference of the AIO to think about the question which I'm going to raise. And the question is this. When you look at the history of development in Africa, after independence in the 1960s, from the 1960s onwards, at first, development was about the state intervening. It, whether they were capitalist or socialist economies, when you look at it, the state was the central player. In the recent 90s and the beginning of this, uh, of this, of this millennium, there has been a shift to market-based economies. So my question around sovereign structures, such as what we've had in Morocco, is are we not walking left, talking right? Are we not contradicting the underlying fundamental macroeconomic philosophies that are supposed to guide the decision making in the economy? And I'm not raising this uh, 
because I'm, I believe that's the case. I'm just saying, let's be careful, because when we have these contradictions, I believe it's part of the reason why many of the development policies in Africa fail because of internal intrinsic contradictions. So my question to us, when we talk about uh, sovereign, uh, sovereign protection, is let's be careful in some of the markets like Mozambique that we're not walking left and talking right. Why is this important? For instance, one of the reasons why there's been a shift in terms of development, history of development in Africa from state-based kind of capitalism or socialism to market-led uh, economies is because the states were perceived to be failing to deliver. So if there's an event for 200 million as per the limit in Morocco that is payable, what are the capabilities of a state such as Mozambique to be able to deliver? Microinsurance development agencies like to talk about, and microinsurers like to talk about access to the consumers. But are we also aware that there is also a problem of access to the government? How many governments can we trust with 200 million US dollars? And uh, so I had lots of questions. Uh, I, will, I will leave it at that and say this is a question I'd like us to think about and just be honest with ourselves. Let's not just go through the motion without thinking about what underlying theories and philosophies we're following. Because there must be a certain thinking that is and principles that are guiding our actions. Or maybe we need to review our policies and theories so that they align with what we're trying to do. Because if we don't do that, we run the risk of not getting to the direction where we want to get. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I've been sitting here listening and thinking, I want to say this, that, and a hundred more things, so I can't do that. Um, I think everybody's raised some interesting ideas. Um, I, I've never thought of the idea of having a fund um, with limits uh, for the low-income people who are not insured and using that as a driver to incentivize people to actually consider going to get insurance. Um, it's, it's an interesting idea. Um, I, I, Kevin, I agreed with quite a lot of the things that you were saying. The insurance industry certainly has a role to play in terms of innovation, in terms of technology, in terms of uh, uh, covering the protection gap. But what we are talking about here is an extraordinary um, risk. And um, I wanted to ask both the guys on the government side here, yeah, sitting next to me, um, what they think of um, public-private partnerships, because I do believe that this kind of risk cannot be addressed by either the insurance industry itself or by a government themselves. Um, or by a regulator in the financial sector um, by itself. Um, it is my opinion, and the South African Insurance Association has many um, projects which we are basing on, we will do this bit if you will do your bit, government. Mm. Um, and in terms of government, I am talking about a wider role for the wider government rather than just the, the regulators of the insurance industry. Um, for instance, uh, there's a protection gap for example, in South Africa in terms of motor, motor insurance, um, because it is unaffordable. No, it's not unaffordable, it's expensive. Um, but it's unaffordable for many people. Why is insurance unaffordable? And I think, th I know I'm talking a little bit roundabout, but what I'm actually trying to say is um, non-life insurance risks and claims and costs are directly related to the broader environment. So. Um, why is motor insurance less affordable than it should be or could be is because there are risks of theft, high risks, very high risk of road safety, of, of road accidents in South Africa. Um, that is not something that the insurance industry can fix in itself. So we need the broader engagement with government, the Department of, uh, of, of Transport in terms of road safety initiatives, the um, South African police in terms of law enforcement and the metro cops. That's an example of how these things work and how together in a wider community we need to find solutions that could work for, 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 um, for, 
for both for government, the community, society, and the insurance industry. In terms of the, the climate change issues, again, um, climate change is happening definitely in South Africa. In fact, I've read uh, a, a week or two ago that South Africa is deemed a hotspot for climate change. Um, we're also not, uh, not uh, an insignificant emitter of greenhouse gases, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, so, so we need to take hands here. Um, what we also have is climate change relating with the man-made environment. So we are sitting in South Africa with infrastructure that are deteriorating, infrastructure that are not maintained. Um, therefore, the risk of property insurance in South Africa um, is, is on the increase. Um, we are sitting with a lack of maintained fire services. Therefore, when there is a fire, which, which, which may relate to, uh, to drought and heat, um, uh, then we get the insurance industry suffers um, total losses, where it could be partial losses. So I am asking whether the, um, whether the fact that I am raising the issue of there needs to be a broader collaboration with many areas in government with the regulators of the insurance industry and the insurance industry themselves. And we need to s seek partnerships to find solutions together. Um, if I have time later, I will mention the agri-insurance proposal that we are doing, which is sort of, okay, I want to relate that to you, to your question, because I think it's an important question. Mm. But and sometimes and I think it's, it's worth talking about it, and also the process of collaboration that I think is, is very yeah. relevant. Yes, I think that you raise a very important point, but I think sometimes there are market failures. Like, for instance, in South Africa, we do not have any insurance product available for smallholder emerging farmers. That is a market failure, therefore we need an intervention or assistance by government to get that market working. We're also facing a potential, very real potential market failure for commercial um, farming in terms of drought cover. Um, especially in terms of multi-peril multi cro crop insurance. So we need to change that situation. The insurance industry is willing to change that, but we need the assistance of government. Um, uh, in terms of, for example, a, a, a premium subsidy or stop-loss cover or some other contribution, um, and we, the year we are speaking about a business class, sustainability of a business class, but we're speaking about food security in the face in um, in the in the uh, face of of uh, um, serious droughts that are going to we know it's going to be more and more and more prevalent. Therefore, the risk becomes almost uninsurable, um, and that is the reason that uh, we are advocating public-private partnerships where we need it, where we don't need it. I agree with you. We should leave people to look after what they know best. Thank you. Thanks, Vivian. Um, so, so maybe at both of you, I mean, both um, panelists have asked interesting questions around uh, policy alignment, collaboration, mm. and other matters. Do you like to respond? Okay. Um, so, so your question, Vivian, uh, specifically on partnerships, what does the regulators think about collaboration between public and private, and we can facilitate that particular role. I definitely, um, I think the regulator can do more in, 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 in engaging government and assisting industry to have that collaboration. We have seen over the last couple of years, especially the initiatives by one of the bigger insurers, which I do think it's an excellent, excellent idea, where they kind of adopt a municipality and assist them with getting the necessary risk management in place. I think that's a very successful partnership between, between industry, in a specific case, this particular insurer, and, and, and government. Obviously, a big issue for us with regard to when it comes to agriculture, a couple of years back, obviously, there was a significant withdrawal, especially from the reinsurance market um, in, in agricultural crop insurance. And, and we, we, with industry, uh, walked that particular journey to, in, to enable a index-based insurance. That's, that's something that we're still working on, and I'm sure we're gonna, we, we will be able to attain it. Obviously, 
we, I personally has partic participated in various discussions around that as well, right? So, so government is also providing in terms of talking specifically about agriculture. Um, we've seen, and that's why we had a couple of years, in 2011 was a big issue for us, um, where there was a dry up of crop insurance. Uh, and then where we were, were hoping that a particular insurer, which is government owned, can breach that particular gap, like the land bank. That was looking at, but it's not fulfilling that particular mandate. And hence, looking at innovation, innovative ways, like for, in, for instance, index-based insurance that we can use. So I think definitely from our side to answer your, your first question is, how does the, the regulator or supervisors think about collaboration? It's critical for the success of this particular country. We as supervisors want to serve the country better. And if we can provide that facilitation or even work together, we will definitely do it. Uh, alors, uh, pour ma part, concernant toujours le partenariat public-privé, je voudrais signaler que le régime que je viens de présenter est le fruit d'un long partenariat public-privé. D'une part, uh, les pouvoirs publics, ministère que je représente et l'autorité de régulation. Et d'autre part, les sociétés d'assurance. Donc, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, la réflexion a commencé en 2004. Et la version initiale du régime n'a rien à voir avec la version finale. Le secteur était certes prêt à introduire une assurance contre les catastrophes naturelles, mais initialement, il n'était pas très enthousiaste. Of course, the public sector was not very enthusiastic uh, because the risk was too um, high. They wanted a limited guarantee and uh, they wanted uh, to be accompanied uh, with um, uh, guarantees that were more or less um, aligned to the uh, international uh, standards. But uh, this is actually the result of a very strong uh, PPP. And uh, the other things, though, is um, earlier on I spoke about the very weak um, uh, penetration rate, um, uh, particularly when you remove the obligatory um, insurance, uh, this um, rate is even weaker. Um, a few months ago, we launched a um, national strategy with a number of um, areas um, as mobile payment uh, and inclusive insurance. And we are trying now to undertake a study uh, to um, look at the different uh, uh, methodology of uh, access to insurance initiative. Uh, ADESI. It is a study or a survey that should give us its results before the end of the year. And that is a way for us to see what are the gaps that uh, do exist, why people are not subscribing to insurance. And we will see at the level of, uh, I mean, the side of um, supply and demand. Uh, we will see how to really uh, bridge um, or reduce this uh, uh, gap. Uh, I believe that uh, we will be able to give you the results uh, by the end of the year. Thanks so much. Um, so I think we are running quite, quite uh, out of time. But I'd like to just offer the opportunity for two or three questions from the audience, if there's any questions that you'd like to pose to the panel before we close. I think there should be a roving mic, so if you want to put up your hand and just introduce yourself, that would be excellent. in front here. Merci. Je suis Thank you. I'm Kwakusi Eric. I'm from the direction of insurance um, in Cameroon. I would like to ask a question to my colleague from Morocco. Yes, 
uh, was saying that um, at the level of uh, financial uh, resources, um, I did not um, uh, get the indication that uh, the uh, state is um, contributing to that fund. Uh, but uh, we believe that the state should be very interested uh, because at the end of it all, it is the state that is the guarantor of the security and the well-being of our population. Uh, so the funding uh, that is on the principal risk where you take a percentage on uh, principal risk uh, is that the major beneficiaries, which are the low income um, uh, people that are in uh, sites where uh, natural disasters, when it um, occurs, uh, brings about very um, uh, huge uh, consequences. Uh, I believe that they should be able to um, have the participation of uh, the state. Now, I don't understand why is it that they are so involved in the governance of the fund uh, because uh, the uh, board is actually uh, chaired by the head of the government. Thank you. I think we'll take um, two more questions and then we'll hand over um, for answers. So any other questions for the panel? Sorry, in front here. Good afternoon. Um, when the the presenter from the regulatory authority of South Africa was speaking. I think she talked about two th um, one issue, which to me is very relevant in terms of risk management before, during, and after disasters. One thing that I am asking is that to what extent are we engaging the communities where these Thing, um, these disasters occur because I had an experience in Ghana where, for example, there was flash floods and then we had a major disaster at hand. And then I called the national authority or in, uh, in charge of disasters to come to the aid. I realized that it took them four hours. In the meantime, the community had mobilized and dealt with the emergencies that were supposed to be dealt with. It was after four hours that the, um, the national authority in charge of disasters and um, with delegations came to inspect the, the issue at hand. Meanwhile, there were emergencies and there were, you, we've had um, uh, incidents where people had gotten wounded. So to what extent are we engaging the communities? Because when it comes to response to disasters, I think that communities have major roles to play in ensuring that disasters are um, maybe minimized or even dealt with whenever they occur. Okay. Yeah, thanks. thanks, Kinsley. Is there a final question? Good. So over to the panelists. Shall I take the first, the second yeah. question? Okay. Uh, uh, I mean, what, what was quite clear from the study that was done on the Nisner fires was the, the communication, especially using social network. And communities are your reporters. They provide the latest updates. But what I was saying is that it must be done in a very constructive and a responsible manner. Because, it, because you've got access to this particular uh, instrument people can provide conflicting messages out there and, and 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 I think it's a good tool we've seen that social media is powerful social media has caused collapses of countries um, we've we that's a, a, a tool that we you need to use and uh, but the, the emphasis is it should be done in a constructive and a responsible manner 
Alors, euh, moi, je vous remercie pour la question. Pour I would like to thank you for the question and the interest that you have to the scheme. Now, um, you want to know why the state is not financing or funding this uh, scheme while it is its responsibility to be useful for the uh, community. Of course, the uh, state is uh, um, supporting us in many ways. First of all, the guarantee, uh, um, if ever there is an issue, it will be the state that will intervene. Um, now, we know that there are two ways of uh, funding. There is a uh, um, budgetary uh, donation that will be given to the fund for it to uh, start. And as you know, uh, uh, it will be done through a uh, tax that will be uh, dedicated to the fund to allow it to actually uh, operate. And then you have uh, another type of DRF and uh, that is uh, managed in Morocco uh, by the Ministry of Home Affairs. And um, that does uh, uh, fund all the preventive measures against um, uh, natural disasters. So, like I said, uh, the state is uh, actually intervening in many ways. Thank you. Um, so, I, th I think uh, we, we're ready to close. I would just like to ask all the panelists to just mention maybe one takeaway or thought that they've got for me members in the audience that are interested to do something related to climate change. What's that kind of first action that you need to take? Because I think this can feel very overwhelming. How do you get a whole government to put together a disaster risk fund? Um, but I think often there's, there's, a, there's a first step, talking to somebody, being open to new ideas, that kind of thing um, that, that, can, that can actually make a big change if you add it up. So if I could just ask each of you to, to share a thought in terms of you know, what can each of us do to make this happen? Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I really enjoyed uh, the interaction and the exchanges. And given that the country where I am based was recently affected by Cyclone Idai, and as per the presentation from Teresa, the impact on the region was in the region of uh, 2 billion US dollars. Um, estimates from the World Bank put the loss, direct economic loss in Mozambique at 780 million US dollars. That's nearly four times the size of the insurance market in Mozambique, although only 10% of the claims were insured. And I'm keen to, to look closely at the model emerging from Morocco and to see what options are available. Obviously, Mozambique today is not in the same position as the Moroccan government in terms of internal financial capacity. In terms of the existing disaster fund mechanism, at 0.06% of the national budget, the government raises on average 10 million US dollars. And if you add a recent donation from the World Bank, it comes up to 25 million US dollars. So as you can see, it's an absolutely insignificant amount being raised relative to the risks that we are talking about. So we cannot talk about an internal saving mechanism of any sort. It will be important to see what sort of solutions can be designed uh, and looking at models from markets such as Mexico that have been able to come up with a combination of public and private sector solutions. And obviously looking at some of the solutions around how the, the protections can be kept in order not to exhaust the funds given the extreme nature of the risk in question. Obviously, the other key question that remains in my mind substantially unresolved is the access. Uh, I don't see many entities that have got actual access and that can deliver to the end consumer. And in fact, when Cyclone Idai happened in Mozambique, it also took out the telecommunications. People couldn't withdraw from the ATMs. So a lot of the ideas that we have were challenged by that particular event. So, but we take courage and we want to see what sort of op options we can come up with. And we, we enjoyed this learning opportunity and we'll continue on looking for solutions. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, working for an insurance association, um, we know that some things take long, and some sometimes you take three steps forward and seven steps backwards. Um, but that does not mean that one shouldn't um, shouldn't try. So, so I think what we need to accept is that we are in an era where increasingly um, things will be abnormal. And the insurance industry is at the cold face of these changes. Um, we need to, to work together. Um, as I said, I do not think any one single role player can fix, can fix this or deal with this problem. We need to accept that we need to work together, and I think that we have a very good example um, with our regulators and policy maker um, that we can talk and that we can convince each other that we've actually, in the agricultural insurance project, we've done uh, the research together. Um, we have had the World Bank help, help us um, at, the ins at, at the request of National Treasury um, to get us where we are now, eight years later. Um, another example of, of uh, you know, don't give up before you start, you have to start. Um, because then in another eight years you will have your scheme. I think it took you eight years as well. Um, so, so the thing is, we, we, we are talking and talking and we've been talking and talking for a long time um, on the risk protection gap. In the meantime, it seems to me as if the, there is a danger that the protection gap is actually broadening rather than closing because of these issues of climate change, the interchange with the infrastructure maintenance, and, 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 and many of these kind of issues. So it is something that we can't fix alone, and therefore we should um, stop talking about the issues and st start talking more to each other to find sustainable solutions that will be in the, in the, in the interest of, of our economies and our, our societies. Alors pour ma part, ma contribution. No, so for me, my contribution would be to emphasize on the importance of uh, developing a national strategy um, for uh, natural disasters, and uh, it should be coordinated and uh, should bring uh, about a PPP. You should start with the diagnosis of uh, the. Um, dangers that do exist um, because before you uh, before we started with the strategy there were a number of existing um, initiatives but there was no coordination so the results were very modest it is better to coordinate the risks to um, uh, assess them to work on the different models you have to of course know uh, the risks but also the actors the role players who does what uh, the coordination should be given to a very strong ministry that could um, uh, really uh, give also better access to information and delegate uh, the responsibilities. Uh, certainly, it will be important to uh, involve um, the uh, private sector. Uh, you have to um, uh, really bridged um, gaps um, in that manner. What are uh, the roles that can be played by the international cooperation, particularly in Africa? Uh, the um, uh, donors of also uh, look at the different uh, um, uh, like the World Bank, IMF, uh, GIZ, that could uh, contribute um, and that are ready to help. We also have to um, associate academia, the academia, the researchers. Um, I believe that all that uh, is a part of how to understand the risk and how to uh, develop the scheme. From my side, um, I think the important thing is communication, where all stakeholders can get together and have that conversation, not just having a talk shop, but also to inherently trust each other. If we want to make this particular country better, we must build that trust with each other. And, and that's how we will achieve significantly more with a collective 
uh, a collective views coming from diverse with diverse perspectives so uh, for me it's the obviously it's trust and have that communication have that open channels with the regulator have that open channels with the policy maker in this case national treasury as well as industry with with the various stakeholders that's important so that relation should be built on trust and that's critical you won't achieve anything if you don't have that trust in place thank you so much so yes excellent discussion i think the the takeaways for me is that it's really critical to work together and also to be persistent i think we've heard a rule of thumb of eight years if you haven't worked on it eight years and are still hopeless at the end of eight years you need to continue and i think we're all in this room because we have a role to play or an interest in this topic and in the end this is this only happens due to the contribution of individuals it isn't the state that will do something or an association it's individual people that are committed and um, I want to give the panel a, a round of applause for an excellent, an excellent discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Merci à vous. Thank you, Mia. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. Mike. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Vivian. Thank you. Thank you. Wise words. <laughs> Merci. Big thank you to our panelists, um, Vivian Pearson from South African Insurance Association, uh, Abdel Jalil El Hafre, Karen Martin, and Israel Munchena. And a uh, special thanks to Mia Tom, our moderator. Um, with this, we wrap up today, and we meet again at 9 a.m. tomorrow um, for the second day of the forum where we will hear the industry perspective on closing the protection gap for disaster risk insurance. Uh, we hope that you join us here tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. Have a good rest of the day. <laughs>